for the parrot room version of, of pop the left, you, you two are going to pick up the 20th century again, but maybe talk about the woman question a little bit more. Yeah. I think it's mm-hmm. always healthy for two white guys to sit uh, on a stream and talk about the woman question. This is pop. Yeah, yeah. This is pop, pop. Oh, 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 oh. Welcome, Diet Soap viewers and listeners and uh, potential future readers. Uh, this is um, an, an episode, a special episode of Pop the Left. It's a response to two interviews that I did uh, under the banner of Diet Soap interviews, um, one with Conrad Hamilton uh, in response to a, a, a manifesto he wrote about uh, having a left response to the pandemic or uh, post-pandemic politics. And the other was an interview with Chris Catrone in response to Conrad, um, sort of based on a plenary uh, lecture he gave a few years ago about the 20th century and how to assess um, the struggle for socialism um, in the 20th century and and through to the millennial left and its death. Um, Conrad watched that response to his interview, wanted to respond to Chris, and I thought rather than continue on with a back and forth individual set of interviews. I'd have the two of them come together for uh, a debate and conversation. Um, Conrad, when you reached out to me, one of the things you said was that you wanted to challenge Chris Catrone's notion of progress and specifically make the case for the 20th century. Well, you know, being obviously not exactly a a walk in the park, uh, nonetheless, uh, having moments of of progress and overall being best understood as a, a series of victories, maybe for human freedom and and uh, and equality. <clears throat> so, Conrad, I want to start with you by asking you how you judge the 20th century, uh, perhaps particularly around the, the struggle for women's emancipation, and uh, how you think we should judge progress overall. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, so, you know, I, again, it's a little bit hard without context, um, but I understand that in your discussion with Chris, um, you, uh, Chris, he said something like, you know, I think, uh, kind of in 1919, we have sort of a counter revolution, you know, in the Soviet union. And then what happens thereafter is simply a sort of, you know, in fact, I think it was referred to as a regression. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, it's very, very complicated. Uh, to assess the the 20th century and the left. And I think that we should resist uh, these sort of hasty generalizations. I mean, is it the case in the 20th century that, you know, the value form was uh, simply abolished and that we realized the sort of communism of the 20th, 23rd century? <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, but I think at the same time, if we look uh, at the 20th century, uh, what we can see is that there were some remarkable achievements in that time. Um, You know, the 20th century, as I understand it, uh, is the most economically equal uh, century uh, in recorded human history. And recorded should be mentioned there deliberately, because, of course, if we go into hunter-gatherer societies or something like that, we're eligible to have a different sort of comparison. But the most economically equal century uh, in recorded history, it's also a century in which, um, while we did see the continuation uh, of, you know, the deleterious consequences of colonialism, in much of the third world, we also saw that there were certain countries uh, that were able to affect a rupture uh, to some degree with that colonial legacy. Uh, So I note that the pace, uh, you know, at which development was achieved uh, in places like Russia and China, um, again, you know, I think 200 million people raised out of poverty in the Soviet Union, uh, 800 million people uh, raised out of poverty in China, uh, you know, has no parallel. Uh, in human history uh, as we know it. Now, obviously, uh, again, um, you know, the question that's going to be asked is, is this uh, a sort of legitimate socialism, right? Um, But I think that it's important to understand that, you know, Marx's discourse was not one of, um, you know, it's either, you know, full communism or nothing, right? It's a sort of obstetric uh, dialectical process. Of course, if we're going to talk about something like markets, you know, and the the continuation of markets, which would be an issue in the Soviet Union and and certainly would be an issue in China today, um, I think it's important to note that markets are something which which presage capitalism, right? By you know, many many centuries, if not, of course, uh, more. It depends how you define it. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can't simply associate markets 
uh, with capitalism. So I, I like the quote that Althazara says about this, right? When he says that, um, you know, socialism is not a mode of production, right? What you find within socialism is you find a mix of different elements, mm. right? But I want to stress that, you know, one can, can break with, you know, in some sense or another, the logic of the fundamental reproduction of capital, right? But still have uh, this, these sort of residue, right? Or remainders which exist uh, within the society. So that's what I would say. All right. Oh, no, that's a very good beginning. So, um, you know, I would say that uh, the regression idea um, is associated with the Frankfurt School, but has its, um, you know, it's presaged by the history of Marxism prior to the Frankfurt School. So it's very much associated with Walter Benjamin and his famous uh, theses on the philosophy of history, on the concept of history, uh, where he talks about the retrogression of society alongside the advance in technology. Um, so a, a couple of things that I would say about, you know, progress and regression, um, and also about the poverty index. I think that that's an interesting way of approaching it. Um, because, uh, yes, in absolute terms, we, one could even say the 21st century so far is even more equal, even more egalitarian than the 20th century, because actually a lot of the greatest strides in, in terms of overcoming absolute poverty have been made since the 90s, have been made in very recent history. Um, and so you could say, well, that is bearing the fruits of 20th century developments that we're, we're kind of enjoying the, the progress of the 20th century now in the 21st century. Um, but really, the issue is, uh, again, for our purposes, politics, um, you know, to get into, you know, you mentioned the hunter gatherers um, or primitive communism in the Marxist parlance. Um, you know, the question of absolute poverty, um, China, you know, so China makes up a huge portion when thinking about the global reduction of poverty. Uh, China uh, accounts for a large portion of that. Um, there's been more progress there than elsewhere. Uh, we could leave aside the question of whether China is socialist or, or capitalist. You could say that China made the greatest gains against poverty in the period after Mao, in the period of uh, Deng Xiaoping. Um, in other words, the capitalist road to socialism has actually seen the most inroads against poverty. Um, but we could leave aside the question of capitalism and socialism at least leave aside maybe the question of socialism and talk about poverty in the modern era, in the capitalist era, and how that's different from in the pre-capitalist era. So in the 18th century, one could say that in many respects, China, to use that example, um, did not have absolute poverty in the way we would measure it in the 20th century. Um, in other words, actually, Europe only pulled ahead of China in the 1700s and really in the 1800s. And then you have the production from Marx's perspective of a new kind of poverty that with the industrial revolution, you have a paradoxical historical development um, that is progressive in certain respects in its potential, but in concrete terms actually uh, impoverishes uh, the world. Um, so the industrial proletariat the working class under conditions of industrial production actually experiences an immiseration that was not the case for workers and, and peasants prior to the industrial revolution. They didn't, they didn't experience the kind of poverty that you saw in the 19th century and into the 20th century. And that that effect that you saw in Europe of industrialization spread around the world in the 19th and in the 20th century um, and then we've seen in the last several decades some, uh, you know, kind of absolute lifting of, of people out of poverty. But that poverty that they were lifted out of was actually the product of modern social developments. Regression, I don't think, is measured in terms of immiseration, though. Um, I think the issue of regression from a Marxist perspective is really measured or characterized, not measured, not quantified, but characterized politically. In other words, uh, yes, people who were immiserated by capitalism have now been lifted out of the poverty of capitalism to some degree, 
But the question is, are we closer or rather further away politically from achieving socialism? And by that, I mean overcoming capitalism, overcoming the necessity of capital accumulation as a form of social, economic, cultural, all around social development. In other words, we still depend on the accumulation of capital for social development, for growth. Right, so we we have a form of social reproduction at a global scale um, that is contradictory, and it's contradictory at the level of growth and at the level, therefore, of development, the forms that development takes. So I think that you mentioned early on, Doug, you said that one of the things that Conrad wanted to respond to on the question of pr progress is the woman question, to use the old Marxist language, and so I pumped myself up a little bit, sort of intuiting. I didn't know that that would be the turn that we would go, but I listened to the ABBA song, Hey, Hey, Helen. Actually, I listened to the um, kind of shoegazer rock band Lush. They did a cover of it to pump myself up um, before, the, before this uh, discussion, right? Before we, I got on with you, I was listening to that. And it's about... Um, the paradox of the freedom to divorce, right? Um, and, uh, you know, in other words, does, does freedom leave you miserable, right? So politically, the question of socialism is really a question of freedom, not a question of, of misery or miseration. It's not just economic by any means, but it's political. And it's political economic in the sense of what's the condition of freedom of the working class? And at a global scale, not in any national terrain, you know, because obviously some countries have been able to insulate their national working classes to some degree from the ravages of capitalism, more or less, more or less. Um, maybe, uh, you know, in the mid 20th century, most of all, maybe in the a couple of decades after World War II, most of all. And then, of course, we know in the neoliberal era of the last 50 years, that has that has depreciated a great deal. The question is why? Why did that happen? Why did the social democratic welfare state and why did actually existing socialism, let's say in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe of the mid 20th century, why did that go into crisis? Why, why was that not sustainable in Western Europe, the United States, um, around the world? Why was the developmental state in the post-colonial world, the developmental state in the post-colonial world also saw decent growth. But all of these went into crisis in the 70s. And neoliberal capitalism was the result of that crisis. In other words, the, the necessity of capital accumulation demanded changes. And that, that question therefore remains. And it's a political question. It's not a political question in the sense of other capitalists, they got greedy and they demanded higher profits. And so they launched a one-sided class war against the workers. I don't think that that's the reason. I don't think that that's actually why neoliberal capitalism happened. Um, so that's, that's really the issue for me in terms of progress and regression, overcoming the problem of capitalism, overcoming the need to accumulate capital as a form of social reproduction, Politically, are we closer or further away from that today than we were 100 years ago? All right. So I, I took a few notes while you guys were talking. I have a couple of questions for each of you. I'm wondering, should I ask my questions one at a time of each of you and then let you can answer I, them? Or do you want can to I just, have... Can I just, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead, Ryan. Can, can I just come back to, to what he said yeah. just for a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to point out a few things quickly um, in relation to what you said. The first, uh, just to briefly uh, tackle the subject of China, I mean, it's interesting uh, and in some sense defensible, but it's interesting when you talk about the alleviation of, uh, of poverty uh, in the Dang and post-Dang era, right? Because I think that one thing we can see is that, and Samir Amin actually is very, very good when he talks about, you know, sort of the imminence of China's economic success after Mao to the Maoist period, right? Um, it was necessary to have, you know, the Maoist period of closure Right, you know, in order to establish, uh, you know, national infrastructure and national industrialization that was then used, right, very effectively when there was the shift, right, to service and light industry under Deng. And we see that, for example, in China, they've been, they've used the 
uh, executive sector to ensure that they maintain national control of their corporations. All of that's very, very important to how they've been able to enrich themselves. So again, right, you know, I'm not saying that China's, you know, this perfect communist state or something like this, but insofar as there's been that success, I think that also we have to relate it to popular struggle in the 20th so century. So politically, though, politically, was the Great Leap Forward, was the Cultural Revolution, were they necessary or not? Or were they setbacks? In other words, if they had taken the Dong Road earlier, right? And was that possible? In other words, were things like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution only necessary in order to keep the Communist Party in charge? Well, I don't think that, I, the thing is that I think, you know, Samir Amin is correct here when he says that, you know, when you're a country that, um, you know, is as devastated as China was after sort of the century of humiliation, it's as logical to shut down your economy to foreign influences as it is to open it up in a certain way, right, when you reach a higher position. So I don't think that, that Dengism could have successfully commenced. Do you uh, see Deng as only the question of foreign investment? You don't see it as um, a national development, like policy, you know, keeping the peasants on the land, preventing um, the creation of slum cities that we saw elsewhere in the world. You know, in other words, there is a kind of political and socioeconomic policy mm -hmm. about control of capitalist development mm -hmm. and you know foreign investment it has been overrated with respect to china i think mm -hmm. that in the 90s there was still more foreign capital investment in the uk than there was in china well that depends a lot on whether you count like taiwan and hong kong as foreign right in terms of calculating they're foreign statistics. Uh, yeah, they're okay. not under the communist party control well, that would, that would, really would be different statistics count that count that in different ways. Well, there is an offshore Chinese bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. right? In other words, and they invested in China, mm -hmm. right? And so, yes, that to, to my point, yes. So in other words, do you count Taiwanese investment in China as foreign investment or not? How do yeah, you I, I, I mean, think I think they that, are. I think that they are rated that way. I, I, I guess what I want to say here is that I think that, you know, if you look fundamentally, um, you know, at the ship towards, as I said, service and light industry under Deng, it's not so fundamentally different than the kinds of economic policies that were favored in a place like India in that same uh -huh. period. I think the real uh -huh. difference is the foundation uh -huh. that's already been assembled. But I want to want, just just to say, I also want to say about your your view of um, political regression, I think could be questioned. I mean, you have to remember that, um, you know, if you look at this time, you know, in Italy, when people like uh, Labriol wrote, when you have a lot of 19th century uh, socialist intellectuals and activists, this was not, you know, conceived as something that could be realized, right, you know, uh, at the level of political primacy, right? And it was really in the 20th century, you know, the catastrophe of the world wars and the tremendous weakening of the bourgeois that opened the door, right, to political victory in that way. So I, so I think that also we have to Wait, question... Which political victory? Well, to the to the to the the actual formation of what we would call proletarian states, right? And again, I realize that's very complicated, you know, and the particulars of that can be debated, right? But what I'm saying is that in the 19th century, that was to a large extent not conceived as possible. It was the mutual destruction of the bourgeois in the 20th century that allowed for the formation of those states. What wasn't considered possible? The like the for example, like in the German Social Democratic Party, right? Like you know, they concept they could they conceptualized. Uh, their victory is something that was sort of imminent to the electoral process itself that would eventually transpire, transpire right? Uh, you know, even 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 when Labriola talks about it, right? He talks about it as something which is you know very very futuristic, right? You know, there are these economic processes that have to play out. We have to reach a certain point, maybe like at that. It's a speculative sort of discourse. Are you talking about a majoritarianism, like in other words, um, and uh, you know, because I I I think the SP day's perspective was actually you know pretty specific. And also Germany is a, a special case. So Marxism in that era before World War One, it, it you know even someone like Eduard Bernstein, a kind of revisionist reformist who sees the possibility of achieving socialism, as you say, imminently within liberal democratic politics, within a kind of majority electoral uh, strategy. That perspective was not his perspective on Germany. That was his perspective on Britain, France, and the United States. In other sure. words, on liberal democracies. In Germany, he thought, you know, this younger state, this Russian empire might might demand some kind of a revolution. Um, in other words, some kind of smashing of the state and reconstitution of the state, whereas the transformation of the state could happen 
And of course, and Bernstein also thought that this was the case based on not purely an electoral victory, but based on a social as well as political preponderance of the working class in civil society through its organizations, like a massively unionized workforce. Uh, you know, we mentioned the women question, women's organizations, mm -hmm. right? It, it's really dependent on that. It couldn't just happen electorally without, without the supporting social movement it couldn't happen just through a vote. Yeah, I don't wish to understate the complexity of these people's opinions, right? All I'm saying is that's that, pretty you know, straightforward, though. That's not too complex. Sure, sure. But all, all I'm saying is that the uh, you know the arrival of the Russian Revolution, right, which occurred at a specific moment, right, Throw when uh, an underdeveloped capitalist uh -huh. state, you know, was thrown into disarray because of the world war, the, the war, right, um, you know, allowed that discourse to transform itself and become considerably less speculative. That's my only point. So I think well, in I'm that not, way, I'm not going to represent like the Bolshevik road to power as like um, the kind of thing that you'd hear on the sectarian left or on the Marxist Leninist left or on the Trotskyist left. You know, I think that there's been a little bit of confusion about that over the last century about what the Russian revolution really represents. Um, in other words, what kind of a model is it? And the fact that it became a model of sorts for the underdeveloped world, for peasant majority countries, is really problematic, I think. Um, and, you know, I think that that's where we're going to go a little bit awry if we just say, oh, well, look, the Bolshevik Revolution proves that the workers can take power. I'm not sure that it really does. I mean, in other words, I'm very sympathetic to the Bolsheviks and Lenin and Trotsky, and, you know, I'm super sympathetic to their perspective, but their perspective was of world revolution, in other words, of a European revolution coming out of World War I, um, not Russia, right? Like, that's not the perspective. Yeah. And when it, by the time you get to China, and it becomes the Chinese revolution, and, you know, certainly the Soviet Union supported, you know, the Chinese revolution a great deal, but it's not... That's not a world revolution that we're talking about. Yeah, we still see a very, very basic. Let me just say, we still see a very, very basic pattern where, but if you look at the third world, right, you know, there are countries that, you know, became socialist and then there are countries that were completely objective, right, and suffered immense poverty, poverty disease and so forth. Um, so I think you can draw a pretty clear line in the third world between the socialism that may not have realized ideal conditions, but did work. Right, you know, and uh, uh, a residual incapacity to develop, which did not work. Well, the question okay, is. Okay, I, fresh, I really have to. I, okay. Let, Doug, I have to jump in. Okay. I, okay. I'll come back to Great Leap Forward and the 30s in the Soviet Union. In other words, um, the, the five year plans, um, Holomodor, you know, do you know your Ukraine history? Were these necessary or were they avoidable horrors? In other words, did it really help? The struggle for socialism at a global scale, it clearly did not. Did it really, were these things necessary for national development? The Soviet Union, talk about foreign investment, they depended upon foreign investment until the Great Depression made that impossible, right? And then they had to go it alone and do a crash industrialization, collectivization of the peasantry. Did the peasantry have to be liquidated in the way that it was in the Soviet Union and in China in the Great Leap Forward? Was that necessary? And was the kind of extreme political disruption and violence of the Cultural Revolution necessary? Were these really necessary to get us to what China has achieved since the 90s? Whether okay. they were necessary. Well, so, okay. well, hold, hold on. All right. I'm going to. So I want to ask a clarifying question here um, to Conrad. And it was about the Althusser quote that you gave. It was socialism is not a mode of production. Could you explain to me when he said that and what he meant by that? Yeah. Because I don't, it seems to me like a little bit there of are multiple ways to, yeah, it's opaque. Because it. like, if it's like, okay, it's not a mode of production, maybe from the point of view of someone who thinks of modes of production as kind of definitively, by, you it's know, not at a the outset. It's not a different mode of production from capitalism. It, well, isn't, is it, or isn't it? I mean, well, like, but I mean, I think that could be what it means. Right. And also, what's socialism? Is socialism lower stage communism? Right. I mean, these are all important questions. What does he think socialism is? Is it not? It, it, is it what Chris is saying that is socialism a transitional form of capitalism? Mm 
or did he mean something like what I think Marx meant in the critique of the Gotha program? Socialism is a stage of self-understanding on the on a, a transition and freedom on a, on a, in a in a moment that would become communism, you know, which overcoming become, the mode of production. Yeah, overcoming yeah. the mode of production altogether, which means that whatever comes next will be, in some sense, a new mode of production, but not, not in the sense that we normally mean a mode of production today, because modes of production today are all based around coercive mass exploitation, uh, you know, mo monetary values, compulsive, yeah, yeah, not free. Right. Mm -hmm. So, the, so of, we have to know, like, what is socialism? And when Althusser says it's not a mode of production, what does he mean? You know well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's useful to get into like expounding um, Althusser's. Uh, what did you mean here. when you cited it? Yeah, what, what I, I, what I, yeah. I think I think it would be better to go in that direction. So I think that um, you know, I think one thing that um, you know sometimes people can mistakenly do. Uh, for instance, there's a tendency to take uh, the critique of the Gotha program, mm -hmm. right? And to which, by the way, was like you know written by Marx for like nine people, right? And only published later by Engels, right? So certainly not a text that was ever intended to be disseminated to a mass audience. Um, you know, and if you look at a text like that, um, Marx de delineates between uh, the lower stage and the higher stage of communism. The lower stage is later deigned by um, Lenin to be socialism. The higher stage uh, is treated as communism. Um, but I mean, you know, if you look at something like that, um, the conditions which are laid out um, for the lower stage are highly contentious and contradictory, um, embedded as they are within the discourse of labor money, um, which isn't, uh, you know, very well uh, mm -hmm. conceptualized intellectually, mm -hmm. right, in terms mm -hmm. of whether we're talking about the abolition of value, whether we're not talking about the abolition of value, what it would mean to create such a system, right? Um, but, you know, I think that what what is clear in any case is that, uh, you know, for, you know, again, we're talking about dialectics, and that I think that, um, you know, for a political project to realize itself, uh, you know, it has to realize itself within a world uh, which is conditioned not just by uh, the capitalism of the present, um, but, um, you know, by mechanisms such as value, property, and so forth, uh, right, which significantly predate capitalism, right? So what I meant uh, when I said that was that I think that in any case, what we're, we, we would have to expect, right, because I don't, I don't tether my reading to a sort of orthodox take on, on the critique right. of the program. I think that what we would have to expect is that there's going to be um, you know, the persistence of these sort of formations, yes. uh, as well as the simultaneous yes. attempt to overcome and transcend. Yes, I agree with that. And I agree with the spirit of Althusser in that respect. So let me, let me turn, if I could, what about the United States? What's the revolutionary strategy or not even revolutionary strategy? What's the reform strategy for overcoming capitalism in the United States? And has the last hundred years seen progress in a place like the United States? or the UK, or France, or Canada, right? Like, where are we? Where are we? Mm. Like, we are talking in the United States, we're talking in Canada. Like, where are we in the, the center of global capitalism still, politically as well as economically, socially and culturally, right? The most bourgeois countries. Where are we with respect to the prospects for socialism? How are we going to get to socialism here? We're asking me a number of a number of questions there. Um, one has to do with uh, the history, right, of worker struggles in these countries in the 20th century, for instance. The other has to do with where we go now. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, in a place like the United States, obviously, we can observe a very contradictory development, right? Um, because I think that while on one hand, right, we can say that, uh, you know, the, the, the movement of workers, right, during the Great Depression, uh, for example, did help influence right? A kind of revolution from above, right? Uh, you know, redistribution that. and I so would forth. contest that in the sense that the Great Deal was formulated before those labor struggles took place, and those labor struggles were made possible by the New Deal policies being implemented. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's actually true. I mean, like, we have, like, huge, labor, about, we have huge labor uprisings in, like, 29, right? What's, what's Roosevelt elected in, in 30, right? Is that 32. correct? 32. 32. And he comes yeah, so we have big uprisings the, already, right? He comes into the program that was um, first formulated by Theodore Roosevelt in his 1912 election campaign. And the personnel who implemented under FDR are actually the same people who worked with Theodore Roosevelt 20 years earlier. So well, that's know, not that's not terribly shocking because we already see like a sort right. of movement for like revolution from above, even within Bismarck's Bismarck's Germany, yeah. right? With Medicare yes. and things like right. this. 
Um, but, you know, in every case, right, like I don't think it's controversial to say that these sort of movements uh, towards welfareism were, were shaped by worker struggles. Within it the is controversial century. because it's a triumphalist narrative of Stalinism. That's where we get that. No, it, <laughs> okay. I mean, whatever. I mean, I think it's I think no, it's no, empirical no, history. And you know. the word Stalin, I don't, I don't think that means something like really awful and horrible and the psychopath Stalin. It just means the popular front politics of the 1930s. In other words, it becomes a question of the progressive versus the reactionary bourgeoisie in the struggle against fascism. And basically, it means the workers subordinating themselves to the progressive bourgeoisie. It's not the case. It really is not the case that the bourgeoisie was forced by the workers to adopt the welfare state. That's simply not true. And in Western Europe, it's the United States, it's the global new deal that really brings about I mean, the Roosevelt welfare. even said okay. this himself. Roosevelt you even know, said this himself, himself, by the way. He said like, you know, I'm trying to protect America for rich people from, you know, workers' uprisings. I mean, that was a very, very candid. He did, he was that doing. was Theodore Roosevelt's perspective as well. And he also said, FDR said that if he were a worker, he would be like a militant, you know, union organizer, et cetera, except he's not, right? In other words, he, he respected the difference there, whereas you're kind of conflating, that narrative conflates the difference between uh, the, the goals, if you will. And of course, you know, the other thing about Stalinism is that for communists to say that supporting FDR's New Deal is a step towards socialism, is a lie. We know for a fact, and in, in fact, what you're saying about FDR proves the point. It's it's a safeguard against socialism, the welfare state. It's a step away from socialism. It's not a step. And by the way, why do they do this? Why do people like FDR and Theodore Roosevelt and Bismarck, why do they do these things? And why do you have Fabian, Fabian socialism in the UK? It's not because they're against the workers. It's because they don't think socialism is possible. They think but you're, the you're thing that's own, possible okay. is progressive. All right, all right, right. It was, it was also I, I, dialectical, right? Because you're saying if things get bad enough, socialism will just emerge, right? So no, well, 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 wait, no, he, okay, look, look, that's I want to... That's not wanna, my perspective at all. You, you can't attribute what you've ever you've heard from Trotskyists. It's not about that at all. I don't think that immiseration or suffering, I'm not a worstist. I don't think that produces anything good. If you look at the periods of politically... Listen. Listen, I want to interject here because I, I have a, I had two okay. questions I wanted to ask Conrad. One of them was about Althusser, socialism and a mode of production. But before that, I actually wanted to ask Conrad, and now I'm going to ask you both this question. I think it will clarify something. So when I listen to you, Conrad, talk about the improvements uh, that happened in the 20th century, um, I heard kind of an echo of Steven Pinker. And your description, which I which I'm not against. Right. Jesus. I actually think Steven Pinker, when read from a socialist perspective, is better than most of the left, like he, because the whole idea of socialism is that it's something that develops out of capitalism, that develops out of the technological innovations of capitalism and the and the industrialization that capitalism brings and the power of collective work that capitalism brings. So Steven Pinker saying, hey, look. We're much better off under capitalism and under the technological after technological development of the last hundred years than we would be without it. It's not necessarily wrong, right? It it it's but it's, technology is a is again, it's can be reified. In other words, it's either right. Well, I mean, you want to avoid thinking that's the end of the road. You want to avoid thinking what that this mode, this way of life, whatever progress it brings. Technology is, the kind is of not going to do it for us politically. It's not going to do it for us. I agree. I agree. So my question is, so my, my question is, how can we imagine that in something that Pinker, Pinker cannot, which is that the kind of capitalist society that we're in will help to create the conditions. That you could have the dictatorship over. of the proletariat. Yeah, that it will create the conditions of its own overcoming, is how I was going to put it. Because that's the way the Marxists thought of technology. It creates the right. conditions for the dictatorship of the proletariat. Okay, Not so socialism. I want Conrad to answer the question first, mm -hmm. and then you can answer the question. Chris, same question to you after Conrad. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I think I think the problem with the discourse of someone, again, I haven't read, you know, Pinker's enormous sort of ponderous book on the subject, but I, I think the problem of... Um, that Pinker's. was a rhetorical flourish. Okay, just forget sure. about Pinker. <laughs> it's I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't read his, his book on the subject, but in general, I think the problem with these kind of narratives, right, is that, you know, insofar as there have been certain improvements under capitalism, the problem with these kind of narratives is that they, um, and in this respect, I think they share com something in common, perhaps with ultra leftists, um, you know, they attribute all of this to capitalism itself. 
right? I think that's the problem, right? So the world's getting better, capitalism is great, and so on and so on. I think what in actuality we can see, right, um, is that I think that, you know, wherever uh, there have been, you know, because it's not enough just to have technology, right? It's not enough just to have a, a more efficient, productive apparatus, right? You know, Mark, part of Marx's point is that, you know, tendentially, which is not to say in all cases, you know, capitalism left to its own devices will engender greater inequality, right? So there has to actually be popular struggle, right? And this is sort of the, the trans, you know, the question of socialism, right? How do we have these, this elevated productivity without the inequality that it seems to so often bring? Right. So it's very interesting if you read someone like like Milton Friedman, right, because Friedman, mm -hmm. when he's boasting mm -hmm. of capitalism successes, he'll say, well, like, look at look at look at, you know, Sweden. Right. And how equal it is. Right. You know, or, or look at, uh, you know, France and how equal it is. Right. But if you look at something like, you know, uh, the level of, of, of socialization that was accomplished in, in, in France, uh, you know, that's uh, part and parcel of the history that's connected to the Pace AF, the Russian Revolution, uh, you know, the communists in France and their importance during resistance, post-war governance and all of this. Right. Um, so about the about the historical question, I think the mistake uh, would be to think that, you know, and again, I think the ultra left does the same thing as the capitalists in this way. Right? I think very often what the ultra left does is they say, oh, that, all that's just capitalism. Right. The agency of actual popular struggle is denied, um, you know, in this kind of narrative. It's not to say that things are simple, but I don't think that we can deny, uh, uh, you know, agency uh, in that way. I, well, um, you're, so you're saying the self so overcoming yeah. of of capitalism happens through the people's seizure of state power. Well, I don't want to simplify too much like to like some kind of, you know, uh, uh, very, very uh, plain uh, rhetorical formula like that. Right. But I think that it advances through through popular struggle. And I think that very often in order to achieve effective uh, change, uh, that struggle has to manifest in some kind of control of state power. Right? So I would... obviously the apotheosis of which is the formation of a state. Um, which rejects, in some sense, you know, bourgeois culture and, and capitalist economy. Uh, to well, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, you know, so or attempts to, as the case may be. France, you know, I'm thinking about the Gaullist state and how the communists are a prop of the Gaullist state after World War II, but it's really a Gaullist state. It's not a communist state. So I would, you know, again, first of all, I don't use the term capitalism as a pejorative. I'm a Marxist. Marxists don't do that. Non-Marxist socialists, anarchists, people like that, liberals use the term capitalist pejoratively. Marxists do not. <laughs> and I'm a Marxist and I do not use the term pejoratively. Um, now, the issue is, so it's not about being like anti-capitalist or something like that. Now, again, you know, whatever you've heard on the ultra left, what you're calling the ultra left, that's not where I'm coming from, like at all. So the question is, okay, so if it's not capitalistism, but it's capitalism, I think that one of the baseline assumptions of Marx uh, is that actually capitalism is a dynamic generated from below. In other words, the struggle for the working day is actually an engine of industrial development. It's not just a response to it. It actually drives industrial development. Certainly the Marxists before World War I understood their own movement as part of the history of capitalism, as, as part of changing the conditions, the concrete conditions for capital accumulation, capital development pushing towards a political crisis, not pushing towards an economic crisis, but pushing towards a political crisis. Uh, this is a period of high growth before World War I and prosperity, in fact. I mean, they had their recessions, they had their crashes and crises, but really it's a period of, of immense development, especially in places like the United States and also Germany. So again, the issue is not, okay, capitalism just makes things worse. Like the capitalists say, oh, capitalism makes things better. And the Marxist supposedly pseudo Marxism is some kind of anti-capitalism, some kind of like, oh, capitalism just makes things worse. No, again, the question is, and you know, I was thinking about like poverty. So what about the new poverty of the neoliberal era? Not inequality, because it really doesn't matter how many billionaires there are. That's not really the issue. You could redistribute all the billionaires billions and that wouldn't eliminate poverty. There is a new poverty of sure, the last 50 true. years that is remarkable. And again, it's, it's a return of the kind of immiseration and poverty that one saw in the 19th century. You know, the working class before the Industrial Revolution is not poor. They're not. They become immiserated. And we've had cycles of immiseration. We've also had cycles of, you know, higher consumption.
And there, you know, again, like you could talk about the lowered standard of living in the last 50 years in the core capitalist countries. And the pro-capitalist, if you will, like ideologues will say, well, yes, there is a kind of lower purchasing power with respect to wages, but goods have become cheaper. And so it all kind of cash. Also, out, welfare out. spending offsets. I mean, if you talk to someone like Andrew Kleiman, uh -huh. he would dispute the idea that the standard of living has declined uh, under neoliberalism. And he would point to the expansion of Social Security and Medicare as places where uh, the the surplus that's generated um, is spent in ways that don't just go yeah, directly social to capital. I don't think, I don't think that, social security has improved during neoliberalism, for starters. I think it's been... You know, it, well, it's expanded. It's whether it's improved or not. I mean, the, the point is like... Disability. If, if you ask someone who's looking at this in terms of numbers... Um, then he would argue, well, you have to. The portion of output into these yeah. programs has increased. Yeah, and that counts as a kind of wage. It well, you it counts it. As you, can, you can frame these numbers however you want, right? I mean, you yeah. cannot count for inflation. Well, not, and say, like, you well, more money is being spent. You couldn't frame things. it as capital re reinvesting in itself. But the, bottom line, but, the, but the bottom line is the tax, you tax rates have, have fallen on pretty much every level. So if yeah. you're talking about, you know, a portion of relative spending, then I think it's so pretty clear So where does that, that come from? Declining. That's the question. I think it's wrong. I think the left has demagogically, and the, the whole left, like progressive liberals, kind of socialist-y, marxy type people, like the whole left has basically attributed um, the last 50 years to a kind of conspiracy and concerted effort of the capitalist class. I don't think that that's really accurate. Um, I think that there's there was a crisis of capital accumulation that demanded a new concrete form, um, new forms of labor, new forms of, of doing business, new forms of concrete production, um, new ways of using technology, all these things, and financialization, all of these things were driven by this necessity. Um, going back to like the from below aspect of things, um, the issue is, you know, there's talk of demobilization in the last 50 years, demobilization of the working class. But one could say that the demobilization of the working class happened a great deal earlier than that. In other words, that the domestication of the labor movement, its integration into the state um, as part of capitalist management, this is after all what the new left reacted to. The new left rebelled against the labor movement as an arm of the state as an arm of the welfare state and as part of the ruling political coalition in the United States, the New Deal coalition of the Democratic Party. What's interesting is that actually the unions exercised a lot more independence in that period than they have subsequently. In other words, subsequently, they've been completely subordinated to just being an arm of the Democratic Party in a way that they actually had greater bargaining power prior to that. But from the standpoint of socialism, from the standpoint of the struggle for socialism, the demobilization of the working class that people talk about is really a question of like the electoral strategy of the Democrats in the last 50 years, as opposed to in the preceding three decades. From the standpoint of socialism, that whole period after World War II can be understood, and not just in the United States, but also in Western Europe, as a massive political demobilization of the working class with respect to the struggle for socialism. Okay, I mean, I think, I think on one hand, I would just say that I think that when it comes to when you talk about a neoliberalism, for example, is not representing, um, you know, as being necessary to capitalism to maintain itself. I mean, I don't think that that's extricable, right, entirely, you know, from what the bourgeois is trying to execute, right? Um, you know, they are the owners of capital above all. Um, and I think that, you know, part of the paradox is that, you know, if we're looking at it from a Marxist perspective, if we're talking about, you know, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall or a consequence of that, which is under consumption, right, one of the paradoxes Right. Is that, um, you know, the uh, loss of, you know, this more extensive redistribution um, has also thrown capitalism itself yes. into a state of acute crisis. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think we can see that, um, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, the, the decline of the working class economically, there were attempts to deal with it right through, you know, enlargement of credit um, through yep. getting goods from China that they yep. could purchase cheaply. Right. But this kind of blows up. Right. In 2007, 08. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's um, important to stress. The other thing about demobilization is I think that 
Um, you know, I think that the, the 20th century was a period of immense mobilization, again, because of the great wars and the instability that that brought. I think that, um, you know, if you look at a place like China, they were their revolution happened just as the capitalist world was kind of getting a big second wind. Mm. Right. So I think that one of the political realities of this, right, is that it's necessary to form sort of states and productive apparatuses, right, to try to maintain, you know, when you're faced with the capacity of the bourgeois globally capitalist class to use unlimited martial violence to try to repress what you've created uh, to fight against that. Right. Um, but again, I, I don't think that we can speak simply of a, a demobilization of the working class in the 20th century. I think there's, there's quite a complex dialectic at work in that. Well, Chinese revolution is not about the mobilization of the working class. Yeah, well, it depends what we call right. Yeah. So, I mean, no, in all seriousness, and Mao himself really wanted to be a junior partner to Chiang Kai-shek. That's what he really wanted. In other words, it, and then it, it turned out that Chiang Kai-shek actually couldn't establish a stable state after World War II in China. In other words, um, and was not interested in the kind of rapprochement with Mao, with the communists that Mao sought. And so, in some ways, the... China fell into the hands of the Communist Party by default due to the, you know, effects of Japanese occupation, uh, you know, obviously the effects of the Great Depression before that, and also due to um, the political unviability of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists to establish a, a national state. Yeah, I don't think the, the issue is really that they wanted to be, you know, a partner. I think the fact is when they started, they were such a minority, right, that working within the nationalist and camp they was necessary. Yeah, and they well, but they, they, they eventually surpassed. They were growing much, much, much faster. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And once they once they got the wind at their back, they kind of carried it away. A peasant army, though, is not the you know Mao was some kind of a Marxist, and you know uh, I think that you know his perspective was also that they wanted to win over the progressive bourgeoisie, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what Chiang Chiang Kai Shek represented, and you know so they wanted a situation like what the French Communist Party achieved in France under de Gaulle, um, even though they were excluded from govern governance, they were an important prop for de Gaulle. But, but again, once they once they actually took power, right, like the program of national democracy becomes something very, very different, right, than what you're describing in terms of the role that the progressive bourgeoisie plays within that. And then even yeah, later, in Mao's rule, then the he's saying, well, now we've got to get, got to get rid of them, right? The so the block of four classes turned out to be a pipe dream of Mao's. He really mm -hmm. wanted it, but it turned out not to be viable. And so you end up with the Communist Party dictatorship instead, and then you end up with two decades of the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, the whole mess. Seven for seven percent economic growth per year, I might add, and inf you know education, infrastructure, Medicare, right, all of the conditions, right, for their subsequent success being created in that time, right? You know, so again, this is not a this is not a simple picture. I don't think the Shah of Iran pointed to growth in Iran after World War II, and in the early seventies, he said. By the 1980s, we're going to be have the same standard of living as France. Why not? Right. They also there was a lot of growth in the developing post-colonial world. This was a legitimately progressive project. I mean, one of the first things they did was pass like a comprehensive divorce law, right? That was extremely radical by the standards of, of China at that time. Sure, right? sure. I mean, yeah, I'm so not for... I'm not against the Chinese Revolution, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is, what does this tell us about the strategy for socialism in the United States? Well, that's a that's a bit of a <laughs> no, no. A I mean, in all seriousness, like I, you know, I'm sitting. We're we're sitting here, North American, yeah. you know, leftists, socialists, Marxists. We want to, you know, progress society beyond capitalism. Mm -hmm. What does the 20th century offer us in terms of how we do that now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that you know what we've seen, um, you know. Uh, in the, the past few years, I think it's a positive development because after, of course, the fall of the, the Cold War, right, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, there was a hope that there would sort of be these anarchist or Trotskyist movements in the West that would, you know, ascend to political power and sort of fill that void. That pretty much entirely failed. Um, I knew that wasn't happening. I knew. <laughs> That that was more, more. I was which is funny because you talk about the millennial left being Stalinist, and I'm thinking like I was joking about this with Doug, right? Like Gen X left does that even exist, right? Um, but yeah, well, 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 there's you guys, there's you guys, right? So there's two. Yeah, we know there's at least two. So more Stalinist. In other words, yeah. they they resuscitated the Stalinism that only that matters, which is the Popular Front. In well, other I don't. Words, I, kind of rad I, I think it's a bit strange to describe it as as Stalinism because like Sanders isn't out there advocating for like democratic centralism or something like that. Um, I can see your point. That's Maybe not what Stalinism is. 
Okay, well, you'd have to. I'd have to know your particular definition of the Stalinism. liquidation of the struggle for proletarian socialism into progressive liberal capitalism. The subordination of the workers to the progressive bourgeoisie. Yeah, but it's bizarre because, of course, like in order to carry carry forth those movements, there actually has to be an ongoing mobilization of the working class, right? Can't sure, there has to be to someone to subordinate. So if what you're saying is that is that having an organizational structure to affect change in the state, no, no, right, and, no, and organizing the working the, class on that basis is Stalinism. Then. It's the perspective, right? In other words, it's how we're going to get there. And starting in the 1930s, you know, and you see it with Khrushchev, you don't, you know, you also see it with, um, you see with detente with Brezhnev, you also see it, you know, in the in the Eastern European countries, you know, they took a lot of loans for development. Um, and, you know, sought uh, some kind of economic integration with the West, even while maintaining their political independence. Deng Xiaoping, again, the, the, uh, the capitalist road of Chinese development. Um, there is this idea of like hitching the wagon of socialism to progressive capitalism. There is, starting in the 1930s. And it comes out of anti-fascism. It comes out of the Great Depression. And I do think that we suffer from being stuck in two periods, the 30s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. In other words, the two things that you raise are working class pressure on the welfare state and women's question. Okay, that's 30s and 60s in a nutshell, right? I would say this is a red herring. This is this is a, a misdirection, um, an honest one. You know, I'm not saying that you're doing this on purpose, but I'm saying that we inherit really generations of bad pseudo Marxism that affect our fundamental perspective. Well, I, think we have to, I think we have to refine, you know, what's happened in the past and, and adapt, develop strategies for the present. But I don't think that kind of, you know, standing outside of history, right, and declaring that, you know, we need a new solution, right, that will be realized without, you know, consulting inductively what's transpired in the past and its successes is really eligible to be so successful. You know, so I think there has to we be, have to deal you know, with capitalism as it is now. We do have to struggle for socialism within capitalism as it now exists. And mm -hmm. certainly as it now exists is is the product of uh, the last hundred years, for sure. And I'm not sure that we really concretely understand very well how capitalism works. In other words, we basically look at ruling class, you know, self-deceptions about what society is and how it's developed. So even when we, you know, talk about overcoming poverty on a global scale in the last like 50 years that's a ruling class narrative that we'd have to interrogate it's not to say that it's, well, it's a ruling class narrative that it's simply a consequence of capitalism i think more correct would say that there's an eminence of popular struggle to the achievement of that for example in china um it's an empirical fact that can be interpreted in different ways but i think there's a right way and a wrong way right sure sure but uh, okay so china, I mean, i'm not sure i even understand that last statement so yeah. the, but poverty Poverty, as we understand it, is a matter of uh, what, how many dollars a day you spend or measured in calories. Calories. Um, mm -hmm. So when we talk about of poverty, particularly, mm -hmm. to think that it isn't uh, somehow a, a product of the way we produce and distribute the world primarily, it's kind of crazy. And, I, the, 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 and the, the, the urge, this urge to continually go back to some trans historical route to, to uh, explain why were you having these problems when i hear you say that it's very reasonable when just read on the surface but i just have this instinctual response where i'm saying oh what he's really doing is trying to find a way to look for something maybe inside human nature or some sort of pre-capitalist form that is not the progressive side of capitalism that doesn't come from that aspect of the society but could be pushed outside of that can, can be made into the actual enemy. And so that's a way to say, look, you know, these, these trans historical forms of, of uh, maybe, I don't know, peasant farming life or a religious life, they're the real culprit. And, uh, and if we can do something about them, i.e. if we can do something about the Republicans, then we can create uh, socialism today. And, and uh, that's just a way to not face the both, both sides of the capitalist equation. Um, so anyway, this is me having my big, Conrad, you just have to bear with me here. This is me yeah, having no my problem, big yeah. emotional response. Who are you attributing <laughs> that to? Who are you? Who are you? Uh, well, I'm, to respect, I'm attributing to Conrad, but I also worry, Chris, about your uh, thoughts about the, the dictatorship of the proletariat and the state, where when it's not, when we don't focus enough on the mode of production, when we don't think about things in material 
terms and mostly about the relationship between uh the capitalist and the and the worker and the exploitation of you know all the all that stuff that well you know, all of that is pretty well established in other words i my emphasis on the politics mm-hmm. is precisely to you know take for granted um you know again i don't think Overcoming capital accumulation means a different relationship between a manager and a worker in a in a point. No, of no, but right, but I mean, right, I it doesn't like mean that because you can have like participation or egalitarian forms of Ooh. relationships on the shop floor, and it won't change anything. And we're also talking about the world, right? In other words, we're mm-hmm. talking about how how are we going to. Otherwise, what we're going to have is, I think that the vision. If I were to be uncharitable, mm-hmm. I would say the vision is to try to move. Canada, the United States, the UK, and France, more to a Scandinavian type society. And I feel like, first of all, that's not. Or today, a Chinese one. No, that's I don't the know other. That anyone who wants that necessarily. <laughs> I mean, you could say maybe there are. It's a, poor con- it's a poor country. That would be the issue. There, no, right? there are. So yeah, the imperatives maybe. they face are very different. Yeah. I don't know. After COVID, who knows? I mean, yeah, but, but yeah. the tankies might say, yes, the United States needs to be ruled by a communist party and, you know, the poor people need to be mobilized against the rich people. And also if the poor people are reactionary, then you put them in re-education camps, whatever. The tankies, no, I'm sure, you know, and there were Sanders supporters who notoriously did say that. That's what, what most do with the Panders supporters think. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, it's like a funny kind of vision how are we going to achieve socialism in the United States by the forcible suppression of Republican voters or something? It's like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you're, I don't know what you're really talking about, but um, about this, <laughs> no, but I think making the United States like Scandinavia. Okay. But well, what, you, we were talking about the United States. So, so I wanted to just say, right. That, um, you know, I think that one thing we've seen, right. So I said, there was really no, uh, you know, this anarchist Trotskyist Gen X left as it were never really materializes. Right. You know, then we're talking about, I'm then there's, now. <laughs> no, I mean he's I so took... embarrassed about being Gen X. He started. He started self. <laughs> like, let me hey, let me let me continue. Okay, let me let me go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, but then we then we get this. You know, then in the past few years, I think that um, you know there's been an effort um, to uh, influence politics. Uh, you know, in a manner uh, analogous, right, to what happened in the New Deal, right, as you're saying, to try to create something like a sort of Scandinavian uh, social model in a place like the United States. I think we can say that the Sanders movement is in some way representative of that right but i think that the problem uh that we have today is i think that you know we don't have the same kind of uh uh, structure that we did in that time in terms of for instance the power of organized labor right um now you when you were talking about you know the 1930s and so forth you seem to talk about it as just this sort of you know uh uh, plot that was entirely conceived top down without any pressure whatsoever from workers i don't agree with that narrative and i think part of the proof that that take viewing it in a purely top-down level would be wrong because you have to ask yourself, why is it the case that these struggles in the United States have not congealed into that more recently, right? Um, you know, and I think it's because this, the, the, the forms of pressure which existed in that time are not available to us in the present. Yeah. I see our impasse right now, right? On one hand, we have a situation where we can see that uh, we're getting a return to sort of the old, like 19th century capitalism, right? Mm. You know, now that this sort of, um, you know, social state has faded away. On the other hand, I think there's a crucial difference to something like, you know, the archetypal example of industrial 19th century Europe, um, because, you know, a lot of jobs have either been automated or in the case of, you know, well, in the case of, you know, uh, a lot of jobs have been automated or in the case of jobs which require people, they've been shipped to places like Mexico and China, right? So it's not taking on that sort of industrial form. Now, the question that I posed, right, you know, in my manifesto for post-pandemic politics that you were responding to, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I take it as a a foregone conclusion that in our existing dispensation, right, when we're confronted by COVID and all these things, that there has to be uh, uh, the use of the state mechanism, right, you know, in order to affect change, right, I do believe that. However, uh, I think that we don't have the same by, uh, you know, that, that the that the working class or by the, the insurgent classes will pilot. Where is the working right? class? As... Well, I'm going to get, let me, let me okay. get to this, right? Okay. So I think that, uh, but I think that, again, the issue is that we don't have something like the old industrial formation, right? So the question really becomes, I think, how do we sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, take advantage of uh, partial proletarian identities, right? Uh, people who are un- un- underemployed, uh, mm-hmm. people who are impoverished, uh, mm-hmm. and so on, right? Keeping in mind that, you know, the reserve army of labor is a very, very important category for Marx. And it's a global, take... it's a global issue. 
Yeah, it's a global issue. And even in China now, automation, you know, is becoming Absolutely. more of an issue, right? They're, yep. they're surpassing their peak proletarian moment. Yep. Um, so how do we take advantage, right, of those voices to create something which isn't just a reformist movement? That's to say something that, that is willing to use the state, um, hopefully to transform things in such a way that the state will eventually become obsolete as we know it, um, you know, but that is able to uh, uh, use a different kind of model, right, than what we saw, for instance, in the 1930s. And I, and I don't think that I'm the first one to pose that question, but I think what's specific about our current moment, um, you know, is the, the, the failure of those efforts uh, to, in a sort of deliberative way, uh, make the United States like Sweden. And just realizing that, you know, under current conditions, there's no way in hell, you know, the, the, the bourgeois are going to concede to that. Right. So about the 30s, you know, I don't want to be, look, it's not about yes or no. It's not a black and white either or thing about was it from above, was it from below. Of course, there was a working class movement. There was a massive unionization in the United States. And there was industrial unionism, which was an, an, an innovation that actually Eugene Debs tried to achieve before World War One. That's what the industrial workers of the world were about. It was about overcoming the AFL style craft trade unionism and organizing people in entire sectors of the economy, industrial unionism. And that's realized under conditions of the Great Depression in the 30s. And that's a remarkable achievement. And it does condition the form of capitalism that issues from that post-World War II, it does. However, again, the question is, is that, is that a basis for socialism? I guess it could have been, but it wasn't, right? It certainly wasn't in the 30s. It wasn't in the 40s and 50s and 60s either. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it disappears, right? So, and again, the new left did respond to that as an obstacle, Yeah. right? And they were right to do that by the way, right? So at, at least partially, um, the social Democrats, like people like Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph, were also right in their way to treat the already existing labor organization as a basis for socialism, right? So it, it's a basis, it's an obstacle. I mean, that's dialectics right there. But of course, we don't have that anymore right now. And there is a need to reconstitute the workers' movement. So my concern when we make reference to the 30s is that there's a lot involved in that model. Mm -hmm. And in fact, again, that's where demobilization and mobilization, that's the difference. And that's the paradox. That's the problem. In other words, let's say that we did use this moment. You know, uh, it's the it's the DSA Jacobin kind of approach, which is, you know, the kind of rank and file strategy. Right. The rank and file strategy. Uh, is based on a 30s strategy, but I understand that 30s strategy to be a demobilization for mm -hmm. socialism. It's a mobilization of the working class for progressive capitalism, and that's not, you know, nothing to sneeze at either, but it's not for socialism, and it it is, in many respects, an obstacle to socialism, too, which doesn't mean that it can't also be a basis, right? But there okay, is so what was being demobilized were like the American socialist movements or the socialists of America and that party and other uh, more radical forms of political organization for the workers. The communists organized the unions. I mean, they talk about the Reds building the unions and that's socialists and communists. And the American and the Communist Trotskyist, Party in Chicago and everything, yeah. Communist Party, but also the Socialist Party in terms of the Trotskyists were entryists in the Socialist Party and they, that's how they participated. And the Socialist Party is per se the Norman Thomas Socialist Party. So the Socialists and the Communists, you know, overall the left um, certainly took a leading role in the mobilization of the 30s. But then again, it comes back to the question of with what perspective? In other words, what is this strategy and what is the goal and how did they organize and what, what role did that organization end up playing in capitalism? Well, I mean, look here, like if you, you know, if you look at the manifesto, right, you know, I do interpret, um, you know, those victories in some sense as, as victories for the working class, you know, and I think that the amelioration of conditions on that basis is discernible. Uh, but one thing I also say is I say that, you know, I think that, you know, the failure of people like Sanders and Corbyn and so forth has shown, um, you know, that, you know, the sort of transnational neoliberal capitalism that we have now, you know, absent industrial base um, is not going to make those conditions. So what I actually call for is a more radical rupture. Right. You know, and in this respect, I say, well, you could look at the Gilets Jaunes in a certain sense as having a positive dimension 
except that I think that, you know, they're so sort of, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Right. That there has to be attempt to sort of transmute these sort of anti-political platitudes into a more uh, tangible sort of program. Right. So I'm not, you know, while I think I have a more favorable assessment, it is actually, you know, I even criticize, of course, the DSA in that. Well, I think I have a somewhat more favorable assessment of these things than you do. Right. I do recognize that I think that we went through a cycle. Right. And we've seen the limitations of that logic and the need to break break with it. Now that doesn't mean, again, I do think that we need to pilot the state in this moment. You know, even if our Which cycle? Get, you mean the millennial left cycle? Yeah, the, the, the cycle yeah. of Sanders and Corbyn. I do think that that now now I think, you know, as surely as, you know, Lenin looked to uh, the Social Democratic Party of Germany and took lessons from it, not all of which were negative, right? Yeah. I think that we can take lessons from what's transpired. Um, but I do think that we have to acknowledge that there's been a break and that we need something new in that respect. Okay, right. listen, I want to do a second round. To end it here and say that in our in the second, ver you know, for the for the Parrot Room version of, of Pop the Left, you, you two are going to pick up the 20th century again, but maybe talk about the woman question a little bit more. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's always healthy for two white guys to sit uh, on a stream and talk about the woman question. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, but seriously, that's that I think is what I'm going to put in the parrot room or we can start there anyway and go wherever we want. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope that people found this first part to be constructive and interesting. And um, maybe we can clarify a little bit further in, in the second half.